in a precious human body. And to live on this beautiful gem, this garden, this delight of a planet. What a gift we were all given when we were given the opportunity to incarnate here, now, on this planet, at this time. We, uh, we live at a crossroads. There's no doubt. We all feel it. We all know it. There's something coming down the track. And uh, we have to figure out how we're going to respond to that. How we're going to turn it into an opportunity for growth rather than an opportunity for destruction. I don't think it's the first time that mankind has stood at such a crossroads. But here we are now facing it and hopefully dealing with it. A precious opportunity which should not be wasted. Um, today I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about some traces of uh, perhaps uh, a lost civilization and uh, these will look primarily at scientific traces and also at spiritual traces of that civilization uh, all around the world. Um, I believe we are a species with amnesia. I think we have forgotten our roots and our origins. I think we are quite lost in many ways. And we live in a society that, uh, that uh, invests huge amounts of money and vast quantities of energy in ensuring that we all stay lost. A society that uh, invests in creating unconsciousness, uh, which invests in keeping people asleep so that we're just passive consumers or producers and not really asking uh, any of the questions. And I found for me the study of the past and the mysteries of the past has been a liberating process in terms of looking uh, at the present. This is the world, of course, uh, as, uh, as it looks today. Uh, we're very concerned about such issues as global warming, climate change, and coming earth changes, uh, which, which many have, in, have intuited. But if you go back uh, 21,000 years, you will find that the world looked very different. There were gigantic ice caps covering the major land masses. The ice uh, over North America this huge ice cap was actually two miles deep. Can you imagine that? Two miles of ice sitting on top of New York City? Well, I don't know, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's how it was. Same in, come closer, I mean, just an, an extraordinary thing. Nobody could, could live there. Any, any traces of whatever was underneath it were ground to dust by the weight of that ice. Europe, the same story, a gigantic ice cap bigger than Antarctica, covering the whole of northern Europe. Just a, a, an extraordinarily different world. This is our world today with its familiar contours and outlines. And uh, this is the world at the end of the last, at, at, at not the end, but at the last glacial maximum, 21,300 years ago. Uh, there was no Red Sea. There was no Arabian Gulf. The Indian coastline was greatly extended. Sri Lanka joined onto the tip. Southeast Asia was a whole continent that is now underwater, just reduced to the Malaysian Peninsula and the Indonesian islands. Altogether, 10 million square miles of land were above water then that are underwater now. And 10 million square miles of land, that's the whole of Europe and China added together in terms, terms of area. So this was a very serious change that took place in the Earth when we went from that to this. And it was a change which uh, 
unfolded over a period of about 10,000 years, but uh, sometimes it was extremely cataclysmic. It wasn't just a slow drip, drip, drip of the ice sheets. What would happen on top of those two mile high ice caps is that you would get a gradual accumulation of meltwater in glacial lakes on top of the ice caps. And this would perhaps accumulate for four or 5,000 years before the boundaries surrounding it broke. And the huge explosion of water poured down off the ice caps, reaching speeds of 1,000 kilometers an hour, coming down, tearing over the land, destroying the landscape, rushing into the sea, and raising uh, sea level. 30-foot, 40-foot rise in sea level overnight happened twice during the last ice age. We can imagine what a 30 or 40 foot rise in sea level would do to our civilization today if it were to happen overnight. I believe it would bring it instantly uh, to an end. Now we have traditions, uh, myths, stories from all around the world of, of an all-destroying global flood. And uh, the tendency of academics is to say that these stories are just what happened was there was some little local flood and the people in that area imaginatively elaborated it into a global flood. I don't think I need such an explanation when I know that there were global floods at the end of the last ice age, when the whole world was flooded again and again and again. Uh, and I do believe that the flood myths uh, from all around the world, amongst which, of course, I include the story of Atlantis, uh, are a memory of real events uh, recorded in myth and tradition. It's rather interesting that Plato, who is the earliest surviving source for the story of Atlantis, uh, tells us that he got it from his uh, relative Solon, who in turn got it from the ancient Egyptians, uh, and that they spoke of a time 9,000 years before the time of Solon. That's 9,600 BC, or 11,600 years before the present, when the wonderful civilization of Atlantis was destroyed in a single terrible day and a night by flooding and earthquakes. Academics think that Plato made it all up, but if Plato made it all up, it's extraordinary that he chose that date and that time, around 12,000 years ago, because that was absolutely at the peak of the meltdown of the last ice age, when there was indeed global flooding. The story is all over the world. In India, it's the story of Manu, the Indian uh, Noah, uh, rescued from the, from the flood by Vishnu. In Greece, it's the story of uh, Deucalion and Pyrrha. The same thing, a, a, a couple who regenerate mankind, surviving the flood, riding it out in a box that, that rides along the waves. The Maya, too, had this story of the end of the last world age and the whole Mayan concept of cyclical time and what goes around, comes around, fits in with this very, very strongly. Here's the story of Noah from the Bible. And if you want to find the origins of the story of Noah, you need to go to Sumer, the land that is now Iraq, where the epic of Gilgamesh, almost 5,000 years old, tells essentially the same story that is told in the Bible um, of a warning, one man warned, the gods are angry with mankind, they're going to send a flood, you must save what you can. It's the story of Gilgamesh, the story, the, the story of the Gilgamesh epic. Interestingly enough, if you go to the Arabian Gulf where the Gilgamesh epic comes from, and you look at the situation at the end of the, at the, uh, at the last ice age, this was the Arabian Gulf at the last glacial maximum. This is not sea. This is a river. This is the combined streams of the Tigris and the Euphrates uh, running through the otherwise completely dry uh, Arabian Gulf, uh, which formed a, a kind of Garden of Eden. It was a, one of the most wonderful places to live on Earth at that time. Um, when most of the rest of the world was extremely arid and very inhospitable. 
And then, around 12,000 years ago, very, very quickly, the whole Arabian Gulf uh, became flooded. Uh, so I think that if we see a flood story from that region, talking of a global flood, uh, it's pretty easy to understand where it came from. It came from what happened. It's a memory. It's not a myth. Australia, that's how it was at the last glacial maximum 21,000 years ago with that gigantic tip of Southeast Asia nearby. That's how it is today. And again, the Aborigines of Australia who've been in Australia for 50 thousand years um, have myths and traditions of global floods. Uh, a great flood serpent which ate up the land. It's put into symbolic language, but again, it's a memory of what happened at the end of the Ice Age. Now, one of the things, when I first began to explore these mysteries 20, 20 plus years ago now, one of the first things that struck me was the the, what I call the mystery of the maps, uh, that there are certain maps that have come down to us from antiquity which show the world not as it looks today, but as it looked during the last ice age. And whenever you look into the story of these maps, you find that they were copied from older source maps, typically between the 13th and 17th centuries. So the maps that we look at are relatively recent. They date from the 13th to the 17th centuries. But when you find their origins, you find that the map makers drew on many source maps which are no longer available to us. Um, and and uh, these ancient maps seem to record the world as it looked 20, 15,000 years ago. This was the level of map making technology um, in uh, the 7th century in Spain and indeed in the 13th century. These are called TO maps because of the shape. They're quite pretty but you definitely would not want to navigate by them. <laughs> They're really bad for navigation. Um, actually east is up on these maps. This would be Jerusalem, the center of the world. Uh, this is the Mediterranean. Here's Spain. Here's North Africa. Um, and, uh, as I say, pretty but, but useless. However, that map's from 1283, and round about that time, end of the 13th century, flooded into Europe a whole new set of maps, and nobody really knows where they came from. Ptolemy's maps, we know of Ptolemy, of course, but he himself 2,000 years ago was drawing on earlier source maps when he created his maps. And those maps disappeared during the Dark Ages. They were preserved in monasteries and they came to the attention of mariners at the end of the 13th century. They're not as good as modern maps, but they're very good and you can navigate by them. Um, another mysterious group of maps appeared at that time and these are the so-called uh, Portolans, the Portolan cartographic tradition. This is the uh, Pisan chart from 1280. It's the earliest surviving example. Uh, that's Italy there. You're coming into Spain and North Africa here and the Holy Land there. Um, what's remarkable about these maps uh, is that they incorporate incredibly precise latitudes and longitudes. Now, latitude is a relatively easy thing to do simply by measuring the height of the sun or stars above the horizon, but the pole star above the horizon specifically. But longitude requires technology. It requires a chronometer that can maintain accurate time as the Earth spins. And uh, our civilization was not able to do longitude until the late 18th century. Uh, and that's why many mariners before the, the longitude problem was cracked would end up bumping into coastlines that they didn't expect to be there because they'd done their calculations wrong. But weirdly, in these older maps, highly accurate longitudes. How do we explain that other than as a heritage from an earlier map-making tradition? Charles Hapgood, his work on the maps of the ancient sea kings uh, is uh, uh, really the best source on this, on this material. And he's suggesting that the Portaland tradition 
came through a predecessor of Ptolemy, Marinus of Tyre, perhaps through Ptolemy, stored in the Library of Alexandria. When the Library of Alexandria was burned down, some of those maps went to Constantinople. Crusaders went into Constantinople and took away some of those maps and reintroduced them to the world. That's roughly the, the suggestion here. I think everybody's heard of the Piri Reis map, which is a Portalan map. And uh, here we see South America's east coast to be compared there, the west coast of Africa. And down here at the very southern tip of South America, a continuous landmass uh, that appears to be Antarctica uh, on a map dating from 1513. And it's really a puzzle if you find Antarctica on maps from the 16th century uh, because our civilization didn't discover Antarctica until the early 19th century. Here's uh, Antarctica as it looks today. And uh, here's Antarctica as it looked uh, around the year 1800 in this map from Russia, which shows no Antarctica at all. And it's not there because we haven't discovered it in 1800. We didn't discover it until 1818. Yet if you go back to the 1600s and the 1500s, Antarctica is all over ancient maps. There it is in uh, this beautiful work of Orontius Phineas, a rather accurate depiction of the continent of Antarctica. And uh, here again, um, a map by Mercator, the, the, the famous, everybody's heard of the Mercator projection, a great map maker. Here again, Antarctica, present in that map. Both of those maps, the Orontius Phineas map and the Mercator map, drew on earlier source maps, now lost to us. Is it possible that those earlier source maps may go back to an earlier civilization? One that had the technology to explore the entire globe to map it mathematically in a way that, that we can recognize today as highly sophisticated, because that's what these maps seem to show. Here's one of those Ptolemaic maps, not quite so good as the, as the Portalands, but still pretty good. And interesting, really, to, to look at Southeast Asia and how Southeast Asia is represented in this huge land mass here, and to compare that with, um, well, there's Southeast Asia today, there it is on that map, and here's how it looked 21,300 years ago. And I find a really remarkable similarity between what the geologists now tell us Southeast Asia looked like 21,000 years ago and what it looks like uh, on this map, even with the tip of the Australian landmass coming into the image right there. Another Ptolemaic map from 1513. Off the British Isles, and off the island of Ireland is a little island here. Can you see it? This little island is called High Brazil. Lots of people believed in the existence of High Brazil. I know personally of two expeditions that were sent out from Bristol, which is a town very near where I live, to look for High Brazil. But they couldn't find it because they didn't need a ship to find it. They needed a time machine. You have to go back 13,000 years to find High Brazil. And that's where it was. The geology shows us quite clearly with lower sea levels at that time. This landmass was exposed around 13,000 years ago. The, the landmass that is shown on that map. And let's go back to the Piri Reis map again. On it, right up here, there's an island which doesn't exist. Not today, anyway. And on that island, there's these curious stones side by side. Do you see them there? That island is in exactly the place where Bimini is today. And underwater off Bimini is the famous Bimini Road. I think that that's what's shown on this image here, how it looked before it was flooded at the end of the Ice Age. Now, if we are looking at the faint fingerprints and traces of a lost civilization that explored and mapped the world more than 13,000 years ago, 
What other traces are there? Well, I wrote a whole book about this called Fingerprints of the Gods, so you'll find it all in there. But I want to, I want to concentrate on, on the spiritual side of things because there is, a, there is an astonishing spiritual continuity all around the world. And I'm going to speak of it today with specific focus to ancient Egypt, uh, but also with, uh, with a secondary focus on Cambodia. Um, again, the Piri Reis map. It actually turns out to be drawn on a very modern projection, which is an azimuthal equidistant projection, and it's based on Cairo where Giza is, where the pyramids of Giza are. So this seems a good opportunity to go to Giza. And here we find the majestic, the incredible, the mysterious Great Sphinx, speaking to us in riddles down the ages, this beautiful and majestic monument, and the pyramids themselves. My wife, Santa, took uh, all of these photographs. She and I have been privileged to visit, visit Egypt times beyond counting. Uh, there is something truly magical and mysterious about that site. It is, it is a very special place on the world. It isn't the only special place, but it is extraordinarily special, and it touches, it touches the soul, and it touches something deep in us, and I believe that that's because it was designed to do that. The three great pyramids of Giza standing there in the desert like three stars brought down to earth. Now, one thing about the Great Pyramid you can tell immediately, even though you might not know anything else, is that astronomy was involved in creating it. The Great Pyramid is stunningly accurately aligned to true north, south, east, and west. It's actually within three sixtieths of a single degree uh, of true north. And that is, uh, that is an incredible accurate alignment. Um, especially when you're dealing with a monument with a footprint of 13 acres. Um, it would be very hard to do it today. We probably could do it, but it would be difficult. And the architect would want to know why. <laughs> I mean, why do you want to do that? You, we can build you this amazing, huge monument, but must it really be within three sixtieths of a single degree of true north? That's making the problem really, really huge. So it tells us not only were astronomers involved to get that level of accuracy, but also that it was important to them. It really mattered to them to be precise, to be on the, on the button uh, in that way. And uh, a second thing which just will not go away at Giza, no matter how angry the archaeologists become, no matter how they swarm out of their nest and leap all over anybody who dares to criticize the existing paradigm. What will not go away uh, is the hint of much greater antiquity surrounding the entire Giza complex. That's what won't go away. And uh, that's what I want to look into a little bit uh, just now. This is from the temple of Seti I in Abydos, and we see the pharaoh Seti showing his young son, Ramesses II, a list of all the kings of Egypt who'd ruled before them. And that list goes back through the historical pharaohs who we know about, back to around about the date that we would call 3000 BC, when Egyptian civilization is supposed to have begun, but it doesn't stop there. It keeps on going back. It goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years before that. Until the time of the gods, the time that the ancient Egyptians called Zeptepi, the first time. When the gods brought civilization to Egypt. That's what the pharaoh is showing his son. A connection to the gods going back thousands of years into the past. And from the tomb of Seti I, again, we see this idea that goes right the way back to the god Osiris. He is showing the way to the future Horus kings of Egypt, how they should live, how they should create a kingdom, how it should be in harmony between earth and heaven. 
everything goes back to the first time, to the time of the gods, to the time of Osiris. Sorry. Temple of Horus at Edfu. Horus is the son of Osiris in the uh, traditions of the ancient Egyptians. At this Temple of Horus, there are whole walls covered with texts. And those texts are known as the Edfu building texts. Um, this is what they look like. And they're very mysterious. Many people, many archaeologists will tell you that there is no flood tradition in Egypt. This is absolute nonsense. They clearly have not read the Edfu building texts. Because the Edfu building texts speak of a homeland of the primeval ones. They say it was an island. They say it's where the gods lived. They say there was a great flood there, which utterly destroyed it. And that those gods who survived came to Egypt, settled in Egypt, and started to reestablish what they had had before. They built what were called primeval mounds all over Egypt, which were to be the sites of all future temples and religious structures uh, in Egypt. Is it possible that some of the monuments of ancient Egypt are actually much older than the Egyptologists tell us? Here's the Osirion in Abydos, named after the god uh, Osiris. And uh, it's a very curious structure, uh, gigantic blocks of stone, 100 ton weights are very common in the Osirion. Um, and weirdly, it's close to 100 feet lower than the nearby temple of Seti I. Now, Egyptolo Egyptologists attribute this monument to Seti I. Um, but it, was, it, it actually appears to have been built at a much earlier phase. Um, it's, just so much, it's just so much lower down. It's like there's been an accumulation of silt on top of it, and then thousands of years later, Seti I came along and built his temple. And then when the archaeologists excavated it, they said, well, that's by Seti I. This is nearby Ah, it must be by Seti I. There's no good evidence connecting it to Seti I at all. The great sphinx of Giza. I'm not going to go into detail into Robert Schock's and John Anthony West's extraordinary work on the uh, rainfall erosion of the sphinx, but it has thrown a real spanner in the works of Egyptology, and the Egyptologists are still very upset about it. You know, how dare a geologist suggest that the Sphinx actually might be thousands of years older than it's supposed to be, because that is what Shock and West are suggesting, that these erosion patterns in the trench surrounding the Sphinx, which we would have seen on the body of the Sphinx too if it had not been restored again and again down the ages, that this erosion pattern can only be caused by exposure to thousands of years of heavy, heavy rainfall. And no such rainfall fell in Egypt uh, in 2500 BC when the Sphinx is supposed to have been built. You have to go back to the end of the last ice age to find that massive precipitation that could have caused this level uh, of weathering uh, in Egypt. And these extraordinary temples that stand in front of the Sphinx were created from the limestone that was quarried out around the body of the Sphinx to create the body Therefore, they are as old as the Sphinx. If the Sphinx is 12,000 years old, then so are these temples. And these temples, um, like uh, mighty memorials of a, of a forgotten uh, past, um, are really hard to explain. <laughs> there are blocks of stone, again, in the range of 100 tons uh, in these temples, and they just have been built up as though it's an easy thing to do, as though it's easy to manipulate 100-ton blocks of stone. Now, the three great pyramids standing above the modern city of Cairo. Um, that atmosphere of strangeness and, and mystery uh, cannot be escaped. Let's take a, a quick flight around the great pyramids uh, of Giza. We're looking from the east side here. Uh, over the village of Naslet al, al Saman, the Great Pyramid, Pyramid of Kefren, supposedly, the Pyramid of Menkara. Um, we'll come around again, We're swinging around to the west side now. This is the north face of the Great Pyramid. 
the second pyramid, the third pyramid. Can you see the Sphinx, by the way? This is the Sphinx down here. Sphinx is 270 feet long and 80 feet high, but it's dwarfed by the pyramids. It almost uh, disappears from view. And here's the valley of the Nile off to the east. So let's just come in closer and closer to these amazing monuments. The top of the Great Pyramid, 480 feet above the ground, a flattened area on top of the Great Pyramid there. And there I am, on top of the Great Pyramid. <laughs> now, I'm not showing this picture for, uh, well, that's how, I, that's how I used to look in those days. <laughs> <laughs> ah, sweet bird of youth. <laughs> how quickly does she fly? Um, we climbed up the, um, the southwest uh, face there, uh, the, the, the southwest corner. And uh, actually, I've, I've climbed the Great Pyramid five times. Uh, three of the climbs were uh, legal, and two were illegal. Now, this was one of the illegal climbs. Um, and on one of the climbs when I had more time, because I was up there legally and the police weren't going to arrest me, Santa and I, we spent some time looking around at the graffiti on top of the Great Pyramid. It's astonishing. There's graffiti going back hundreds of years up there. Even Mercator, that map maker, he left his graffiti up there. Loads of people have been climbing the Great Pyramid and leaving their graffiti. Including, I found, and this was an astonishing moment for me, uh, one step down, just behind me there, is a piece of graffiti that says, P. Hancock, April 5th, 1916. Hmm. My grandfather was called Philip Hancock. <laughs> ha! He was in Egypt in 1916. After we got down off the pyramid, I called my dad, he was still alive then, and asked him to look at my grandfather's diary. What did he say for the date of April 5th, 1916? One single line. Climbed the Great Pyramid today. <laughs> it was an extraordinary moment for me. And... Uh, there's something about this place. It's like flying on a magic carpet above the city of Cairo. It's just, it's such a privilege, such a gift to be able to, to, to go there. I don't want to bore you with statistics. It's just 13.1 acres. It weighs 6 million tons. It's got 2.3 million blocks of stone. It's 481 feet high. It just is the most amazing thing. You know, it's just, you, you, you can look at it and just kind of miss it, and then you look at it closely and you begin to realize you're looking at something that's utterly impossible. I just want to take you on a quick journey around some of the interior of the Great Pyramid. Um, and uh, I think we'll start, we'll start down here in the so-called subterranean chamber, which is 600 feet vertically beneath the apex of the pyramid and about 100 feet uh, beneath the base. Um, and uh, it's carved out of solid rock. They went 300 feet, a sloped corridor, sloping at an angle of 26 degrees. Uh, you have to go 300 feet down it, and then you reach this chamber at the bottom. So they had to make that chamber. They had to cut down through the rock 300 feet. It's about 3 feet 6 inches high and the same wide. So you're going to go down like this all the way down. And you get to the bottom, and here's this rock-hewn chamber deep, uh, deep underground. And here's a couple of likely lads in the rock-hewn chamber. That's me and my friend Robert Boval, the author of the Orion Mystery, just to give you a sense of the size of the room. Now, coming out of the subterranean chamber, let's go back up this passageway which leads to it. There it is, cut from solid rock, as, uh, as I described. And then you come to this junction here, and you go up the so-called ascending corridor, and along a horizontal passage that leads you to the so-called Queen's Chamber. We don't know what the builders of these pyramids called these chambers. All these names are modern attributions. Um, let's just take a quick look inside the Queen's Chamber. The statistics are there. There's these curious little shafts in the walls of the Queen's Chamber. Up until the 1870s,